So what I wanted to talk about was new kinds of companies. And what I've been saying, and we certainly have seen it already this afternoon, I started to witness this trend in which I was seeing these new kinds of companies, these new kinds of startups. And they were doing something that was really interesting. They were making physical products. And I know we all love Twitter, and we'd love the no next you know, social network to be created as a startup. But what struck me was the number of people who were doing physical products and startups. And the second thing that caught my eye about it was the magnitude, kind of how big the dreams are of what people were attempting and succeeding at. And so I saw this trend taking place. I was trying to put words to it. And I certainly am familiar with it on the scale of industrial companies, large companies do it. But I, 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 I was amazed by the power that I saw in these small groups of people getting together with enormous goals and being able to solve them. And so I was trying to understand this phenomena. And the reason I got interested in this is, you know, I have a long-term personal and professional interest in making things. You know, personally, I, for 40 years, I've been building boats, and I've been building sculptures, and I've been making machines. Um, right now, this summer, I'm, I was building electric go-karts with my kids. I've made rocket ships. I've made furniture. Um, just all kinds of things in, in my personal life. And in my professional life, where, where we make software, we make software for people who try to make things. So I also have a professional interest in providing the tools to people who make software. And so whether it's the buildings, you know, the built environment around us, or it's the manufactured products that we see, or the media and entertainment we consume, we build these tools for people to be able to do it. And you know, in many ways, I'm incredibly fortunate that I get to work with some of the most creative, innovative people in the world. But it doesn't surprise me that they're able to do amazing things. When you look at the talent they assemble and the amount of money that's brought to bear on the problem, it makes sense. But what was going on in these small companies was kind of interesting. And so I live, in the, I live and I work in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so I just took three companies. And I wanted to talk about these three companies. And in some ways, they're each unique and they're special. But they're also emblematic of what is this much bigger trend and what's going on with these companies. And so the, fir the, first, company, um, the first company I want to talk about is a company called Moon Express. This is a small company that's gotten together. And what they want to do is take robotic missions to the moon. So they, they want to do a space exploration mission. Now, that sounds fine if you're NASA. It sounds great if you're the European Space Agency. But imagine just getting together with your friends and say, we're going to build a spaceship, and we're going to go to the moon with it. And so what, but that's what they're doing. And what's interesting is, here's the, new, here's the new spaceship. And just as we saw from the people who spoke before, and we've heard all through the conference, what they're doing is they're totally questioning all the assumptions. They're totally challenging the conventional wisdom about what it takes to go to space. And they're being able to do it in a way that's completely different. And so their goal is to get there in a time frame and at a cost that's unimaginable by any of the large agencies. And they're really doing it by going back and looking at the specific things that have limited and made it expensive and made it time consuming and going about the problems in different ways. And that, and that willingness in that kind of audacity to just challenge what everybody says is the knowns and go at it from a different point of view is, is what makes them special. Now, the, now the, second one, the second company that I was looking at is a little bit more terrestrial. This is called Lightning Motorcycles. They design and they make electric motorcycles and other electric vehicles. Now, what's really cool about them is they just broke the land speed record for a production motorcycle by going 218 miles an hour. By the way, the engineering challenge of going 218 miles, it's not getting enough power. There's plenty of power in an electric motor. First challenge is keeping the bike on the ground. The second challenge is keeping the rider on the bike. <laughs> keeping the rider on the bike turned out to be a harder problem than even keeping the bike on the ground. But this is out of a garage, handful of people. 
and they've gone 218 miles an hour. They just, um, they just put, here they are at Bonneville Salt Flats after beating the record. And here they are in the Pikes Peak Challenge in which they raced against you know, traditional gas bikes and beat them all in the climb up Pikes Peak. So what was unimaginable a few years ago that an electric motorcycle would beat all these gas bikes just happened. But they weren't done. So nowadays, they're totally rethinking the materials, rethinking the manufacturing processes, so that they can build a lighter, stronger bike and go even faster than 218 miles an hour. What's amazing about their 218 mile an hour bike is that at 218 miles an hour, it gets about the equivalent of 60 miles a gallon. And if you drove it at a more normal speed of like maybe 65 miles an hour, it gets the equivalent of about 300 miles a gallon. It's an unbelievable piece of engineering, but it's being done in a small garage. Third company. This is a company in uh, south of market in San Francisco. It's called Cambrian Genomics. And Cambrian Genomics is laser printing DNA. Okay, so you know, you think 3D printing is cool. You know, you get little Pez dispensers, you get little toy soldiers made of plastic. This is 3D printing of DNA. Now, the first time, the first time I went in there, and uh, I know some of the people in the audience have already met people like Austin who run the company. I walked in and I saw a machine that sat there, and it looked just like a normal 3D printer. You know, it's about this big, and Austin starts talking a mile a minute. And I'm like, whoa, 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 Austin, you got to slow down. I, I just don't get this. So explain to me what you're doing. And so he starts again. I said, no, 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 slow down. I see there's four tubes coming into this 3D printer. What are in the four tubes? And he goes, A, T, C, and G. And so he's assembling base pairs of DNA one at a time and printing them. Not getting perfect yield on it, but figuring out how to optically select. The, the ones that are correct, and then bind them together, make strands of DNA, resequence it. It's happening in a little, in a building south of market that was made for web startups. All the other people in there, web startups, and there's one small lab in there in which they're producing DNA. He's producing DNA, and I'm, I'm excited to go home tomorrow night. They're having the first gene launch party in which they've successfully done this. Their, their, their hope is that they will be able to make more DNA in a single batch than we are able to do in the entire world put together today. So just one batch done by printing will be more than we can do. And so what's the, what's the reason for doing this? It's that people are doing science. You see people in their bedrooms doing science. This, this is a picture of the iGEM conference. This is high school kids who are hacking the new biology. It really is the new software. And you know, just as we use director sets and Legos, the, the tools of tomorrow are bacteria and virus and DNA. Just to put this in perspective, here's a group we're working with at the Wies Institute at Harvard. What this is a picture of is a nanoscale robot. Okay, tiny robot. It's made out of DNA, but DNA here is being used not as an information carrier like we're familiar with, it's being used as a structural component. If you take the right strands of DNA made by Cambrian Genomics, you put it in a beaker and kind of shake it up, DNA has this amazing property of self-assembling. It gets emergent behavior because it self-assembles and only goes together in this one way. And so what this device is, it's a hinged device. It looks like a clamshell. You can see the hinge in it. It has a clasp on the end. And when it mates up with another cell, it opens up and releases a payload of drugs. So if you think about this, this is going to be one of these things when you're able to target specific cells and deliver a payload of chemicals. It's going to make these ideas of, for example, how we treat cancer today, which is it's great we're learning how to detect it, but we still have this bar barbaric idea that we're going to bombard the entire body with poison and somehow hope we kill the right cells. So this is a completely new step in doing it. And again, it's being done by a small company. So let me talk about what I saw as kind of the things that are going together that are letting all these companies do it. And the first thing we're all aware about is the access to capital. 
you know, whether it's traditional venture capital, typical angels. There's also all the new internet crowdsourced or crowdfunded things that are giving people access to capital. But as we'll see, in most of the cases, capital isn't really the obstacle people have imagined it was. It is not at all there. So people are raising money this way. And, and I think there's this new phenomena that's coming out in which many of us are probably like the patrons of old. We support projects not because we expect a financial return, but we, because we believe there are certain things that belong in the world and we want them to be there. I don't know how many Kickstarter projects I have funded just with the idea of, I, I don't expect money in return. I just want to see this thing exist. I, I think it's worthy of being in the world and I want someone to try to do it. So the funding is out there in more ways than has ever been available to entrepreneurs than before. Now, of those three companies I talked about, the amazing thing about them is between the three of them, they haven't raised even $10 million between them. So just imagine, I'm going to the moon, I'm going to laser print DNA, I'm going to break the land speed record, all for less than $10 million. Kind of incredible. Now, so what's coming about? So I would say the other thing in addition to the money is the easy access to information and people. You know, and it's no, it's no more difficult than the square box. You can type in and you can get access to information, access to people in ways that were unimaginable before. It used to be we had to wait around for scientific journals to be published. I would say less and less of the interesting information in the world, in the world is behind those paywalls. There's an amazing ability of people to get together um, and share their ideas, whether it's open source hardware, open source software, just knowledge, the willingness. What used to be I would go to the library and look in the Dewey Decimal System to find something, and maybe there was a book on a subject published 30 years ago. Nowadays, I find in 30 minutes, I can be connected with an expert in the world who's usually more than willing to talk about it, is eager to share what they know, and have someone else who's interested connect with them. And what I thought was particularly interesting about the teams that I saw at many of these companies, they have a different characteristic. They tend to be small. They tend to be totally cross-disciplinary. Like what I, what I like about the Cambrian Genomics guys, there's one expert in microfluidics, one in mechanical engineering, one in genetics, a team that came together that could only exist in that environment. And so for all the talk in academia how they work on these kind of projects, I don't think a project like that could be done in any college or university in the world. The ability for people to collaborate in that way doesn't exist in the academic environment. Now the other thing that's out there is access to tools. It's access to tools. So for example, there are tools out there that allow people to have access to design and digitally prototype anything they're making. So why is there this explosion of physical things? We now have tools so we can understand the things we build completely. We can understand what they look like, how they behave before they get to market. We can experience the things before they're real. And it comes about because of this idea of infinite computing, the idea that we have an infinitely scalable resource of cloud computing. And if you change the basic assumption that computing is expensive and precious and rare, and you turn it into saying that it's available and free and in the limit, it's infinite, we can now model things and understand and predict the behavior of things and try out variations digitally instead of waiting for these things to get to the world. But in, addi in addition to the tools that everybody has, and it's an incredible tool set that's now available to all of us who want to work. The thing that I think is the most amazing thing that seems to characterize all the entrepreneurs, it's a mindset difference. And so particularly as we look at manufacturing, what the mindset has changed from is a mindset that, had a, that used to place a lot of value on things like quality and efficiency. And it, most everyone realizes that this model is changing, where the premium is really on innovation, it's on doing things differently, and it's on doing it with agility. That's where it's changing to. And I think it's that mindset combined with um, an ability 
to be able to make these things. So you have this mindset, you have the tools to fabricate, whether printing, whether 3D printing or subtractive or robotic. You take that mindset that says it, I have this digital tool set, and I put together with an attitude, and I think it's probably best summed up by what Henry Ford said. Here's, here's, here's this quote. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. And you know we, we've seen it today, stories of these companies, the stories of the people on stage. It's really this unfailing belief in themselves and the ability to solve that, those problems that, that does it. And so when, when, when I think about it, I go, you know, whether you're really trying to search the universe, whether you're trying to break the land speed record, whether you're trying to reprogram life, the thing that's most important is that, is that belief in yourself that you can actually do it. Thank you. <laughs>